Venice is famous for many things, not least of which are its beautiful sleepy canals spread out almost endlessly across the city. Almost at every turn there is something new to discover here, from a unique classical building to the polished gondolas and a quiet uniqueness rarely experienced anywhere else. Indeed, nowhere else can you experience such tranquility in an urban area without the roar of traffic. Sadly today, Venice is slowly sinking, and eventually, in several hundred years' time, it will disappear under the water level forever. A new project, to slow this process however, has been planned, and will take the shape of several barriers, similar in fact to the Thames barrier, to protect the Venice Lagoon from flooding. As we approach the Piazza di San Marco, or St Mark's Square, the gateway from the lagoon is perched one of Venetia's emblems, the Lion of Venice, atop his column. And next door is San Teodoro, Venice's other emblem. The Archaeological Museum houses a number of ancient sculptures, and, like most of the buildings here, is adorned with beautiful wall mosaics, depicting religious scenes from the Bible. The Basilica di San Marco is dominated by its 99 metre bell tower, standing separately from the Basilica. Originally built in the 10th century, it mysteriously collapsed on the 14th of July 1902, only to re be rebuilt in brick. St Mark's Square itself plays host to completing flocks of pigeons and tourists, but its atmosphere is always buzzing with chatter and the sounds of live music coming from the surrounding cafes. The Basilica di San Marco itself exhibits a magnificent blend of architectural styles, ranging from Byzantine through Romanesque to Renaissance. The front facade boasts some superb mosaics, featuring the Madonna and Child. The Basilica is now Venetia's official cathedral and was rebuilt in 1097.
The stylish and unique gondolas of Venice are a hallmark of the city. Many are privately owned and are still used as private transport. But others are hired by visitors keen to get a first-hand view of the canals at close quarters. Many of the gondolas are decorated with polished bronze to give a gold effect and the experienced rowers offer a graceful trip. Another facet of Venice are the beautiful masks to be found everywhere. They frequently display a velvet opulence and are, and are originally made for the Venice Carnival. But they do offer a mysteriousness unique to Venice, which has the effect of intriguing visitors. As we join the Canal Grand, we approach the famous Ponte di Rialto, or Rialto Bridge. This stone bridge stands in one of the oldest parts of the city, surrounded by small markets on either side, and was completed in 1592 by Antonio de Ponte. The beautiful archway and decorative style attracts visitors from all over Europe and beyond. And with the nearby markets and cafes, this is one of the busiest parts of Venice. The Canal Grand or Grand Canal is one of the most famous boulevards in the world. It is on average 6 metres deep and stretches for 3.5 kilometres in an S shape from Santa Lucia railway station in the north to the open Venice Lagoon in the south. It is bestowed with fine houses and churches all along, some a little dilapidated today but still offering a fine and romantic journey as we head now on a Vaporetti southward along the Canal Grand.
The San Polo area of Venice is characterised by narrow streets and alleyways interspersed with canals. This is one area to get away from the crowds at busy times and there is a pleasant unspoilt charm that is hard to describe. Gothic architecture is quite common here and another common feature are the window boxes, usually full of fresh flowers and adorning brightly coloured walls.
There are more than 200 churches in Venice. This one is a Carmelite church called Chiesi del Scalzi, or Church of the Barefooted. Inside there are some frescoes of the painter Tiepoli, and the peaceful nave contrasts heavily with the bustle outside. The Church of San Giorgio Maggiore has one of the most prominent positions in Venice. Situated on its own tiny island, it has had a significant influence on contemporary architecture and features an austere interior in bold contrast to its exterior. It was built between 1565 and 1580 and is partly notorious because of its prominent bell tower which stands 60 metres high and from which panoramic views can be had of the entire city and lagoon area. The island of Lido forms a natural barrier between the Venice Lagoon and the Adriatic Sea. In the 19th century it became a fashionable seaside resort and was featured in Thomas Mann's famous novel Death in Venice. Although less fashionable today, the Lido still offers an interesting contrast to the lagoon area.
This is the Palazzo del Cinema and every year in September it plays host to the Venice Film Festival. As we come to the end of our stay in Venetia, we head for Santa Lucia railway station where we catch our Eurostar train heading southwards to our next port of call, Rome. The Foro Romano and Palatino, more commonly known simply as the Forum, was the commercial, political and religious centre of ancient Rome, and stands in a valley between two of the seven hills of Rome, namely the Capitoline and Palatine hills. The Forum was constructed over 900 years, but in the 4th century AD its importance declined, and eventually many of the buildings fell into ruin. During the Middle Ages, the area was plundered for its precious marble and stone, with many buildings left half standing, and eventually it became pasture land. It wasn't until the Renaissance period that renewed interest in all things classical led to the entire area being excavated. And indeed, excavations continue today. Construction of the Colosseum, or Colossio as it is also known, was begun by Emperor Vespasian in 72 AD in the grounds of Nero's private residence and was inaugurated by Titus in 80 AD. The massive structure could seat more than 80,000 and was home to many wild beast and gladiator combat shows. These shows originated as part of Etruscan funerary rites and as a form of human sacrifice, but gladiatorial games far outstripped this ritual context. Gladiators were slaves and prisoners of war and sold to gladiatorial schools or volunteers. Although gambling was technically illegal in Rome, vast sums were waged on gladiatorial combats. But these combats were more than just gruesome forms of entertainment, however. The state-run shows were a public display of empire and the Roman state's authority over life and death. Below ground level are excavated many of the gladiatorial chambers where not only the gladiators were kept, but also many of the other Colosseo staff. Today the Colosseo is undergoing extensive restoration, expected to be finished in 2004.
At the south end of the amphitheatre has been restored the Emperor's stage, from which presided the Roman Emperor over proceedings at the Colosseum. One of Rome's patriarchal basilicas, the Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore, was built in the 5th century during the reign of Pope Sixtus III, although its main frontage was added in the 18th century. The bell tower is Romanesque but the rest of the church is Baroque. Its serene interior contains many notable mosaics and elaborate decoration and in the adjacent Capella Sistina contains the tombs of Pope Sixtus V and Pius V. The busy Piazza Venetia is overshadowed by the Monumento a Vittorio Emmanuel II. This is a monument and not a church, and contains the altar of the fatherland and the tomb of the unknown soldier. It's a spectacular sight both by day and night. The Trevi Fountain is one of the most popular sites in Rome. It completely dominates a tiny piazza. Designed by Nicola Salvi in 1732, its water is supplied by one of the city's earliest aqueducts. A famous custom here is to turn with your back to the fountain and throw a coin in, ensuring good luck and your return to Rome.
The Piazza di Spagna and Spanish Steps have long provided a popular gathering place for visitors. The piazza is named after the Spanish Embassy, but the steps were built with a legacy from the French in 1725 and lead up to the French church Trinita dei Monti. The Pantheon is the best preserved building of ancient Rome. The church is dedicated to the planetary gods and was built by Marcus Agrippa in 27 BC, whose name still appears on the front. Its dome is considered to be the most important achievement of ancient Roman architecture. Lined with Baroque palaces, the Piazza Navona is Rome's social centre and contains three large fountains. The art of mime is also alive and well here and is always a popular place to spend some time.
As we cross the river Tiber, winding its way towards the sea, we begin to approach the Vatican City and the Basilica di San Pietro or St Peter's. The vast Piazza di San Pietro is a magnificent site. It was designed by Benini and laid out during the 17th century. It is bounded by two semicircular colonnades, each of which is made up of four rows of Doric columns. This is where the Pope, head of the Catholic Church, addresses his worshippers. Every Wednesday, Christians flock here for an audience with the Pope. The Vatican City itself has its own postal service, currency, newspaper, radio station and army of Swiss guards responsible for security. The Basilica of St Peter's owes much of its modern appearance to Michelangelo and later to Carlo Madono who took over the project after his death. One of its most impressive features is Michelangelo's Dome, which is an architectural masterpiece and soars to 119 metres above the high altar. The views to be had from the summit of the dome of the entire city of Rome and the bricks buildings of the Vatican City below are unrivalled. The inside of St Peter's can hold up to 60,000 people and contains many treasures by Benini, Raphael and Michelangelo. Security here is stringent and it is forbidden to enter St Peter's in shorts or with bare shoulders. The Sistine Chapel to the right, containing many of Michelangelo's most famous works, is today unfortunately closed, but this does not distract from our memorable visit. <laughs> 